This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Is there is there a sports podcast in Detroit that people are talking about? Hey everybody, this is Freddie Cohen of ESPN Radio. When I'm not talking about breaking news or breaking news on ESPN Radio, I'm always a fan and listen to the Detroit Sports Podcast, and so should you. Thank you for downloading episode 238. I am the Doc, John Macaroon. Joining me, my cousin, on this fine episode, Adam the Jock Strozinski. What's up, cuz? What's going down? Dude, I can't wait to talk on this podcast. So much going on. You got the Red Wings making moves. You got the Lions being boners. There's all kinds of stuff going around with MSU. Pavel Datsuk had some stuff he talked about. After winning Olympic gold, I mean, there is so much to delve into, and we're going to do it right here on episode 238. Before we do that, though, we have to give a round of applause. The U.S. is the best curling nation in the world. <laughs> we ripped it from Canada, and it's good to know sitting here that in the world of curling, we took that sport back, we grabbed it by the throat and said, listen, Canada, you think you're all that in hockey, curling? If we put our mind to it, we're the best curlers in the nation, baby. And the best at women's hockey, too. That was awesome. Two, two sports that, if you're an American, you can fully get behind and pledge your support because you understand exactly how both of those sports are played. No, you don't. In terms of the Olympics, I'm so happy that I'm a night owl. Got a chance to see all the tweets. They were like, okay, it's that time. Great contest, United States versus Canada. And so I sat through it, and I'm like, oh, man, I was gripping. I was nervous. I really wanted the United States to win because it was like United States won the first gold in Olympic women's hockey, and then it was like Canada, 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 Canada. The nation hadn't lost in like 20 years on Olympic ice and things like that in terms of the gold medal, and the United States ripped it from them, and it was nice in terms of the shootout. Our goalie, my goodness, 20 years old, wow. Yeah, she was awesome. going to be good, dude. And that Forsberg move, unbelievable for the United States. So that made the Olympics for me. I didn't pay attention to much else other than the fact that it was cool for the United States to take curling and things like that. But I'm glad we could put a bow on the Olympics. Not much really moved the needle for me outside of the women's gold medal. How do you feel about the biathlon? That's where you cross-country ski and then you shoot a rifle. That's... I'm, I'm not sure how that became a sport. Right. I find it to be so interesting, though. Like, you're going to sit there and you're basically going to ski walk for miles and then you're going to come to random spots and you basically have to shoot uh, like a like a like the bottom half of a solo cup from I don't know 100 200 250 yards away with this rifle. I, I just at, w- at what point did this become a good idea? Yeah, the only story from the Olympics that really caught my attention outside of what we just talked about was there was this lady that just decided, look, I'm really interested in being an Olympian, so I'm just going to go and do the snowboarding oh, thing. The snowboard, yeah. Yeah, she just decided, like, look, I'm just going to qualify, and she was the worst one. She did no flips. She just went up and down the track, and I'm like, wait a minute. She just showed up to events, and just based on the merit on her showing up, she got to be an Olympian. I'm like, well, that's kind of cool. But she was the worst one, and they kept reshowing uh, her run, and she did no flips. She just went up and down, and people say that she's like one of those odd birds that you tell her, like, look, you know you're the worst. And she's like, yeah, so what? Like, uh, no care. emotion. Yeah, right. I just did it. I w- I've always wanted to do it. And so she represented in the Olympics, and it was kind of interesting. But other than that, I'm just, I was over it. I wasn't really into it. I guess the other thing that people talked about was, I guess all the Olympic uh, women in terms of figure skating all took a dive and they hadn't fallen collectively like that in years. And all of them in the short program went up, did their flip and oh, and they all fell and they just massively disappointing in figure skating. But I didn't care. Didn't move the needle to me. Really? You know, it was so weird. I wasn't interested very much in the Winter Olympics. Like, I would tune in if it was on, and I would watch, but it wasn't like it was appointment viewing for me. I wasn't like, oh my god, the uh, the 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 women are are playing hockey now. I've got to go watch this. You know, I was upset because the games would start at like midnight, and I got to get up early in the morning for work, so I couldn't necessarily make that happen. I'd always catch parts of the replay, but it was it wasn't appointment viewing for me. The Olympics kind of seemed to come and go, and I was kind of like, all right, cool. You know, normally with the Olympics, I got to watch the opening ceremony. I got to watch the closing ceremony. And there's usually certain events that I'm really dialed in on. Not so much this year. You know what did move the needle for me? 
the Red Wings at the trade deadline. Finally, I mean, if you make a move once every seven years and you can get an applause for it, good for you, Ken Holland. You got a chance, in essence, to basically flip Thomas Tatar. Good for you. You traded with the the Vegas Golden Knights, who are obviously going all in. What an organization. Oh, my goodness. They got draft picks galore, so they so they could, in essence, give the Red Wings a first, second, and third round pick. Problem, though, the Red Wings took their most productive offensive weapon and shipped them out. So the, the they sold, and it was good, but... The, the, the tough part was, at the trade deadline, it's offset by the fact you didn't move Mike Green. And people are really upset. They felt like it's Ken Holland's job to move him. You had two years to move him. But the part that I think is a little bit more concerning is they want to bring him back. Dude, it's 32 years old. I think it's time. Not, don't have veterans in their 30s that are playing defense. Just go with a young defensive core. Why on earth, if you're rebuilding, would you bring back Mike Green? So I give... You know, uh, the grade that I gave on our Twitter page at Detroit Podcast was B minus. Good job. You got something for Thomas Tatar. You are stockpiling picks. Here's the problem, though. It will be Ken Holland if he's here making the picks. So I don't have any confidence. There are, you know, people smarter than me that are doing advanced analytics. In terms of the draft, when you draft highly, the chances of somebody being a productive NHL player are basically 18%. The odds are a long shot that you're actually going to go out there and pick a guy that's going to play around 200 games in the NHL. So building through the draft, most teams are doing it. The problem is, though, when you don't have a general manager that's hitting consistently more than average, we're going to be waiting five to potentially seven years for any of these dudes that we're stockpiling up on to get to the NHL. So if you're thinking, great, we're going to stockpile all these picks— and we're going to be back in the Stanley Cup hunt in the near future. Sorry to disappoint everybody, but this is painful. The The Red Wings are stockpiling picks, but I'm not confident in the guy picking the groceries. Yeah, this is going to be a tough process. I mean, let's just get Super that out of tough. the way. Yes. It's going to be at least a, a three- to five-year rebuild. you got to do it through the draft. You can't just go out and sign guys. And Ken Holland has shown that he has struggled with drafting players. I mean... His current picks, the guys that, that you're waiting on right now to come up and make a difference, I mean, honestly, they're not doing a very good job. Tyler Bertuzzi is up right now, which is, okay, cool. Uh, Sh- what, Shvechnikov? There we go. Easy for me to say, right? I mean, the guy's played almost 50 games, and he's only got seven goals, right? <laughs> and you're, you're counting on him to, to sit there and put the puck in the net, and he's playing in the AHL right now. So he's, he's that next tier, that next wave of guys who's supposed to be up here. You know, you got other guys that are, that are playing in the AHL, like, Philippe Hornick, and that guy's only got eight goals. Between both those guys, you got 15 goals, and that's a starting defenseman that you're looking at, and that's a starting right winger. That's not helping. That's not going to help you out. You know, and I mean, you better hope. You better hope that Rasmussen is what he's supposed to be. You better hope that pans out. Better hope that works out, and uh, and, and, and Sherdev works out for you. Otherwise, you're going to be in a tough spot. I just, at this point, I don't believe in Ken Holland, and yeah, he did a really good job trading Thomas Tatar. I mean, let, let, let's talk about that trade. That was he's got a king ran, king's ransom for a guy who I don't know if he fit into to what's going to happen going forward. You know, so he was unable to load in a, a current asset who probably didn't fit the scheme going forward. He totally got out of the contract because he didn't have to absolve any of that money, which was like a Jedi mind trick. So he saves $5 million the next couple seasons. On top of that, he gets a first, a second, and a third going in consecutive years. Awesome. You did a great job there. Didn't do such a good job with the Mrazic trade. And then by not moving green, I- I'm-, I'm totally perplexed by this. Like, I don't know how you don't move Mike Green. And I heard different interviews that he's done. He's like, nobody's called. Nobody called. Nobody called. You get on the phone. You call people. Say, hey, you guys need a puck moving defenseman. What are you willing to give? You know, and you go from there. You could put so many conditions on that trade where if Mike Green only played five games, you get a six round pick. If he plays 10 games, you get a, a, a fifth round pick. If he scores five goals, you get a, a fourth round pick. I mean, you could, you could sit there and you could basically make it to where it is no must, no fuss for the people who are trading. Do you know what I'm saying? Like everything could be a promised pick or, or, or a conditional type of draft pick where if he really is hurt and he can't help you out, you're not losing anything. You know What do you really get for a seventh-round draft pick? Usually you don't get anything. You get a guy who gets water and carries the pucks for you. That's what you get. 
I, I don't understand why you couldn't go in at the bottom basement, seventh round draft pick, and then you just sit there and you just add conditions where it just multiplies and builds up until you can get something decent, maybe a third round draft pick. I, I, I'm totally perplexed by his logic. And then to want to go back out and re-sign Mike Green. I like Mike Green. Mike Green is not the player Mike Green was five, six years ago. He's not the same player who, who can get it done like he used to get it done. And at this point, you trade away a guy like a Thomas Tatar, who's a 20-goal scorer for you. He's one of your more productive offensive players that you have. He's a guy who can usually create something out of nothing, and you give him away. You're going to bring back a guy like Mike Green. It, 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 it's, it's very confusing to me the thought process and the theory that's going into effect here to try to make this team better. If you're going to go young, go young. If you're going to go old, well, keep the guys that you have and go old. You know, it's like you can't have one foot in the water and one foot on the beach. Either you're in or you're out. And I feel like, again, Ken Holland is kind of straddling the shoreline here because he's not sure what he wants to do. What do you make of this? Because people are asking Ken Holland regarding kind of his theory regarding the mix of veterans versus young cats. And what he comes out consistently saying is, look, we want to have a couple veterans in that room to teach these young cats the Red Wing way. When I hear that, I can respect that, but at the same time, that sounds a little bit played out. You know the Red Wing way. You got videos. You got, you know, cups and photos. You, I don't think you need that many veterans to teach these young cats. You, you don't. need two. You don't. That's it. Max. You need you need somebody for to handle the forwards. You need somebody to handle the defensemen. Yeah, That's all you need. Exactly. And so what I feel like the challenge is with the Red Wings is that they are not fully committed to blowing it up and rebuilding. If they had committed to losing, if you go into 2016, 2017 with a commitment to losing, if you had a little bit of wherewithal regarding the draft, there's a highly touted defenseman coming out of Sweden, Rasmus Dahlin. By all accounts, everybody's like, we want this dude on our team. He's the consensus number one pick in the 2018 NHL draft. Everybody wants him, and anybody that lands and wins the lottery is going to get a chance to get him. But the way the Red Wings have kind of done things and Ken Holland probably will never admit it, but he could probably say, look, old ownership didn't want to just blow it up. They wanted to keep getting into the postseason. I had to follow orders. Now the onus is, look, let's rebuild through the draft. But at the same time, here's the problem. Because of what was done, there are still a handful of contracts that are really handcuffing you, so you can't really rebuild until a lot of money comes off of the books. That's why a lot of people are really thrilled and, and looked at the Thomas Tatar trade and said, look, great. The Red Wings have to pay none of it. The Vegas Golden Knights are taking the entire salary. They're paying it. That's a contract off of the books. But here's the problem. You got Zetterberg. You got Nielsen. You're still paying Johan Franzen. You still got bad money on the books. And unfortunately, in this salary cap era, any contract that's this bad and you got multiple is going to hinder you. You still got money that you're paying out dudes that are no longer on this team. And so with Ken Holland, it's just... The consensus is his time is up, and I'm thinking, based upon what you've told me and what I'm reading, is that the likelihood of him being the general manager in 2018, 2019 is going to be low. He's going to be with the organization, I do believe. I don't really see him going to Seattle. I think he's just going to be moved up, given a better job, and somebody else will be given the task of rebuilding it and picking the groceries. And so that's what I hope happens, because if it's announced that Ken Holland is the one that's going to be the general manager in the next two years, it just takes my interest level way down. Like, I was talking to Jason, talking to people, and I'm like, how many hockey games have you watched from the first face-off until the final buzzer? Nobody's told me more than five. Yeah. Nobody. And for me, I basically, at this point in time, am catching a period a, a game. Be- because of the fact that it's not interesting. They're not scoring enough goals. I don't see a lot of great storylines. There's a lot of holes on this team. It's not fun to watch, especially when you can watch teams like Toronto. You can watch other teams that are doing a lot more things on the ice that are more productive. And then you see... Steve Eiserman wheeling and dealing and what he's able to do, he doesn't seem to be handcuffed by what, you know, the contracts that he's given out. And when there's a bad contract, he just kind of finagles it, moves it along, and he's working his magic over there trying to do some good things with Tampa Bay. So if Ken Holland returns, it just doesn't seem to me like my interest would skyrocket or really invest in the next couple of years. But if a new general manager could come in, bring in his guy, kind of take the same groceries and maybe mix it up and maybe get a little bit more output because... When you make the same mistakes, when the play is constantly in your own zone, you can't get the puck out, 
it just seems like the 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 mix of talent that they have versus the style of play they want is just totally mismatched. And it, it's really ruining the love of hockey for everybody. I mean, you throw out a question for the Lions, you get 50 responses. You know what? Do you know what question I asked that's literally gotten a response now for the better part of three weeks? The only question I've asked regarding the Red Wings that has gotten buzzed and generated anything was, tell me what you think of Ken Holland in one word. And and people are still answering that question three weeks later. So I keep retweeting it, and we've gotten 70 responses with a lot of uh, loser, uh, past his prime, sucks, things like that. A lot of people, some people are kind of showing loyalty to Ken Holland, but the only thing that's moved the needle has been, what do you think of Ken Holland? Everything else is just a big fat dial tone. Nobody really cares. And that sucks for the Red Wings because I like hockey. I think it's a competitive sport. I like the fact that the Wings had tradition. I like the fact that, you know, the Red Wings are in a new building and they can do some things. But this mix right now in the last two years has been like a big waste, right? Like big, I just wish we could just flush the last two years out. Fast forward to three years from now, we could see what's, what the, what this rebuild is going to look like because it just sucks right now when a team that you follow just sinks to this level and they're not competitive even to make the playoffs, man. Come on. You, you got to commit to losing. And yeah. that's the only way you're going to get better is by getting decent draft picks. I mean, right now, the Red Wings have a 17% chance of possibly winning the lottery and ending up in the top three. That's not very good. There's other teams out there with a better than 50% chance. You've got to commit to suck in order to get players that are going to sit there and help your team and, and take you to that next level. You could look at the Red Wings roster and there are zero stars on this team right now. Zero. If you look in the pipeline, I'm not sure you have any there either, especially with the way some of these guys are struggling in the AHL or the WHL. You know, it, it, that's a little bit of an issue. I mean, you're sitting there and you're investing these draft picks in these guys, and yeah, I know they're, 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 they're top, I don't know, top 20 draft picks, but still, you need to get into that, that top five and go get guys yes. who are going to instantly make an impact. Look at the way Toronto did it. We were sitting there around the table on Sunday night, me and a couple of my buddies after a hockey game, and we were talking about the talent that Toronto has. I mean, they've got superstars, then they've got stars, and then they've got guys who are, aren't quite a star, but are a really, really good player. You know what I'm saying? Like, 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 Van Riemsdyk is a really good player. Not quite a star. Not a guy who can sit there and, and take over a team and make a team that much better. But if you surround him with talent and, and you sit there and you give him some guys who know what they're doing, he's a really, really good player. It, it's just amazing to look at what they have. I was just going through the roster and I was like, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. And it's just like, like we all came to, to an agreement that they've got a bunch of talent over there. You look at the Red Wings. You don't have any stars. You don't have anything. I'll argue with you that Dylan Larkin is not a star. Dylan Larkin might be a very good player. Dylan Larkin hasn't taken that next step in his career. And I know he's young. I get that. Don't give me that he's young because I'm seeing guys come in the league instantly, like 18 years old, and take over and dominate the league. So I get it. I understand. But still, Dylan Larkin is not a star. Might be, top end, a very good player. Anthony Mantha, I'm not sure. Book's still out. He, I, I, he's a physical guy. He can score. He can pass. He's got, he's got, he's got it right. He's got all the intangibles. I just got to see it on a night in, night out basis, and I don't. Couple things before our first break. At least it looks like we're going to get uh, a condition hit with the Philadelphia Flyers because Mrazek hasn't lost a game yet, I don't believe. I think he's playing really well. The last I checked, I think he was three, four, and zero with the Flyers, and just goes to show you. Look, surround these dudes with talent. They can play. Philadelphia, they brought in a new goalie, wins right away. Right. Would you have expected that? No, not right away. You, I would have. You would have felt maybe 500, at least being realistic. No, you no. thought he was going to walk in and play good? Yes, because I, the team in front of him, nice. he's, got, he's got decent players in front of him, right? Yeah. So if you don't put your goalie in a bad spot with your shady defense that has trouble clearing pucks and clearing guys out from in front of your net, and if you have guys who can put the puck in the back of the net, I think that's the biggest issue with the Red Wings right now. They don't have guys who can score. They don't have guys who can create. If you look at Philadelphia's team, Claude Giroux, he can score. Uh, Wayne Simmons, that guy can score. I mean, that is a big man who can sit there and move around with the puck. He can do things. They've got pieces. They've got guys offensively who can score. And they've got guys defensively who can score. So I, I think Mraz is going over there. It's no surprise to me that he's been able to go in, step in, and start winning games. Also, I think... There's a huge chip on his shoulder. I think going into the season, he had a chip on his shoulder. 
And then whatever happened, it kind of the way it ended up working out, he ends up getting traded. I think that chip just got that much bigger, and I think he's out to prove that he is better than what Ken Holland thought he was. Okay, and then I want to hear, what was it like going to Little Caesars Arena with Pops? How did you enjoy the game? And they played well. The Red Wings played well versus Carolina with putting the pucks in the net. So I will say this much, okay? I, okay, so first off, a little backstory on my dad. My dad's a complainer. He, he bitches about everything. I love my father, but he bitches about everything. Uh, I took him out for a steak dinner, and the bill came to like 120 bucks between the two of us, and like no drinks. So it was just, <laughs> just, just the meal. Like it was an expensive ass dinner, right? And uh, he sat there, he bitched about a steak. And he was like, he was like, ah, I, just, I think that shit's overpriced. Okay, pops. <laughs> Whatever. It was like, I, I don't know. I love my steak. I thought it was great. I had some of yours. I thought it was great. I'm not sure what you're complaining about. Anyways, that's my dad. Okay, it's just Jesus Christ. Yes, that's just how he is. It's what it is. So I just accept it. No big deal. Our seats were were very high up. I didn't realize that they were as high as they were. Oh, you got the nose nosebleeds. Yeah, yeah. So as we were making our way up there, he was like, "Oh my God, these stairs, these stairs, like oh, it's so high up." And I was like, "Calm down, like just calm down." And you act like you're gonna have a heart attack. What's going on? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> so we get in our seats. He sits down in the seats. He's like. With all this damn money they spent on this thing, he's like, you would have thought they'd have made these seats wider. Like he just found things to bitch about the entire time. And he the, has a point, though. He's right. Because <laughs> when you spend eight hundred million dollars, that's what people know. They know the number, and you you cram people. These are regular folks just want to go to a hockey game. They don't want to be rubbing legs with other dudes. Seriously, I get it. I get it. He he is absolutely right in his complaints. I think that you know and I. In our time here, talking about Little Caesars Arena, we've been spoiled in that we can get lower bowl seats and things like that, and we can do some things. But for the average Joe, if you're going out there once or twice a year and you sit in the upper bowl, forget about it. It's going to ruin your time because Michiganders, like I tell Vito uh, when, we, when, we, when we chat, I'm like, dude, Michiganders are fat. We, like, are. To, we like to yeah. eat and drink. When it's winter for six months out the year, yeah, what well, are you going to do? Yeah, everybody's pushing 250. Right. So you got this- <laughs> Everybody's pushing 250. Even the women, they're pushing yeah, 250. So the average fan in the upper bowl is probably 260. <laughs> right. So who was sitting around you? Did you get comfortable a little bit or no? Well, we ended up actually getting okay seats, right? So we were like row seven upper bowl. So they weren't like that high up, but okay. my dad made it seem like, oh, my God, we climbed Mount Everest. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we ended up having an end seat, and we had like the first seat off the end. So we I ended up sitting next to a really skinny lady. So I don't know what the hell he was victory, bi- victory. Yeah, I don't know what he was bitching about. And I gave him the end seat so he could have more room. And he's like, "Well, you're bigger than me." So and like, I'm not that much bigger than my dad, but like, he's like, "You're bigger than me. You want to sit in the end?" I was like, "No, just like be comfortable, man. Like, like be comfortable. That's all I want you to do is be comfortable." I will say this much though, right? Because when I went the first time, I did not go to the upper bowl. I did not go do that loop around. That's pretty cool. Like that, that upper bowl is pretty cool. They've got some really neat things. Me and him found uh, this little area that they've got like different uh, memorabilia, different. Uh, they got like Iserman skate. They've got, um, I think it was like Mike Vernon's helmet, different stuff. Some, uh, some, uh, I think it was Isaiah Thomas's shoe, just different stuff with, with different information. And I thought that was really neat. It, it was, it kind of gave like a little bit of a, a hockey museum, a basketball museum feel to it, a lot more so than what's going on in that lower bowl. Uh, when you first come in and you kind of do your loop around, I thought that was really, really cool. What was it like and watching? He the, really enjoyed that. What, would, what was the sight line like being up in, in the nosebleeds? Um, okay. It was weird because that Jumbotron is so damn big, and we were sitting right on the corner of the Jumbotron. So you're peeking at it, you're yeah, pe- watching the ice, you're, you're trying to, you're not sure which one to do. Exactly. And you, you, you've got basically, you're right, we were right where the corners come together. So you get kind of this, abstract view going towards your right you get this little bit of an abstract view going towards your left and they meet right in the middle so that's kind of weird and it draws your attention there because you just you're just paying attention to it you're like i don't know what the hell to look at and then you look at the ice and then you look back up then you look at the ice and you look back up and i don't know overall i found the seats to be quite enjoyable besides that aspect of it because you could see everything you could see there's not really a bad seat in the house i don't think i think they kind of took the same thing with joe lewis because joe lewis as much as that place was kind of a dumpster fire, it was our dumpster fire, and there really wasn't a bad seat in the house. You could be all the way up in the nosebleeds, and you could be right next to the press box. I felt bad for the guys who who sat there and write for the papers because that press box was shit. Yeah. But anyways, you could be that high up, and you still had a good view. And I feel the same way. I felt like we were right on top of the action, which is what you want. 
Um, the old man, though, felt like we were just a little too crammed in. Everything was a little bit too high. Felt like everything was a little bit too overpriced. Uh, he did enjoy that he didn't have to pee in a bathtub yeah. and that his penis wasn't, you know, three <laughs> inches away from some other guy's penis. So that was cool. Um, he did make fun of me because I got the, the short guy urinal twice. He was like, ah, oh, you get the baby urinal. So, and then I did find the, the beer holder in, in the, in the stall. I thought that was neat. I thought that was way cool. Glad I didn't get a picture of my wiener in there because I was totally like holding a drink, <laughs> holding the phone, wiener in one hand. Oh man, it was, it was crazy. I was like, got to make sure we crop this just right because no wieners going on Twitter. Okay. So for what it was worth, you enjoyed your time and you had a good time with Pop. I thought it was good. I had fun. I do realize how old I am now and that's an issue. Because 10 o'clock hit, my old man was done. Like, just done. He's like, I was like, you want to go back to the bar? We went over and we seen Mikey. Uh, Mikey does uh, uh, Breaking Down the Ring podcast where he talks about wrestling. You guys should check that out. It's awesome. I was like, well, let's, we can go back to Old Chalet. We go see Mikey and whatever you want. He's like, ah, oh, maybe we should go home. And I was like, I did not fight him. Did not fight him. I was like, all right, cool. We can go home. So then we go home. My wife's like, so how did your dad enjoy it? And I was like, ah, he complained the whole time. <laughs> and she was like, well, you should add. For once a year, you take them. I think it's worth it. You yeah. got to do it. It was good. It was, do it. it was a good time. That's my thought regarding the arena is save your money. Don't go maybe 10 times. Just save your money. Enjoy one nice experience. Spend like 300 bucks and just go down there and go once a year. Right. And you, you'll probably have a better time than you'll have a better time than sprinkling out five or six games in the upper bowl. I feel like just go once a year and enjoy a TV because for the price of going, you can just sit and buy a great TV nowadays for five, yeah. 600 bucks, get a great TV, get a good setup. You want to mix up the flow, go down there once a year, get nice tickets, $300 combined for a pair and have a night. That's it. That's what it's probably made for right now. These days, I will say this much. The experience in the arena is not better than at home. It's just not, it's not. If I could do it all over again, I would have waited They'll probably the day I have to buy my tickets. Yeah. Save myself a bunch of money. Save some money, yep. And probably got better tickets. That's what I would have done different. Yeah, exactly. And so it's up to Ken Holland to fix this, and many people don't feel like he might even be the guy that's even worthy of having the job to do it, but we'll I see. Don't think he, I don't think he's here. I don't, I don't know how he can come back. I'm exactly. not sure how that works out. I, All right. I don't understand it. All right, let's take our first break. We'll come back. A big decision was made by the Detroit Lions this week. We'll talk about it next on Doc and Jock. Doc and Jack here for our host site, Podomatic.com. When Adam and I first started this project, we were looking for a great place to host all of our recorded audio. And thank goodness we found Podomatic. Why do we use Podomatic? Well, Adam and I, we're going to rant and rave about Detroit sports every week. We'll have great heated debates, and then we'll take this great audio and upload it to our host site. Real quick, super easy, and then we generate a link so that all of our supporters across the country and even overseas can find it. Look, you guys see it. Podcasts are popping up all over the place. So if you're listening and you say to yourself, I can do that, maybe I can grow to be as successful as the Detroit Sports Podcast Network, then you got to have a great host site. Doc and Jack, Vito, Jason, Steve, all the hosts here on the network, we're going to recommend one host site and one host site alone. Podomatic.com. So news broke because earlier on Tuesday, Ziggy Ansah got paid. Oh, my goodness. $17.5 million is the number for Ziggy Ansah. The Lions hadn't basically franchised anybody in the last six years. So they looked at it, and they said, okay, we got a defensive end that can do some things. He's talented. He's a homegrown guy. They pulled the trigger on it. And so my first thought was, no. No, if you're going to use a 3-4 system, how does he fit into this? You're probably way overpaying for a guy. But then when you start really looking at it and you start delving a little bit deeper, I'm okay with it, and here's why. If the new head coach, Matt Patricia, is actually watching film because he's been here now two to three weeks, he's watched probably every single snap of Ziggy Ansah, and so you know Quinn and Patricia met up and said, look, what do you think? And I do believe Patricia stamped it and said, we need this guy. So with that said... Ziggy Ansah is going to be a star. I think he's going to get 10 sacks in 2018. He's going to do the job. It's only a one-year tag. One year, $17.5 million. And look, what news came out? The salary cap in the NFL went up even more, $10 million. So it's not really crushing you to pay Ziggy Ansah. So It might if, only cost you 7.5 right, is what you're saying. If Matt Patricia greenlit this 
and he looked at the film and said, this is my guy, then he's the Doc's guy. I think he's going to have a big 2018. I co-sign on it. My first reaction was like, ah, you probably could save the money and, and spread it out among other positions on the defense. But I really do believe they looked at it. They watched the film. If Matt Patricia is on board, because he knows he's, he's not uh, unfamiliar with the notion of, hey, let's let guys go that aren't going to be productive. I think he watched the film. He saw the potential for an edge rusher. And, hey, they just don't grow on trees. You know why Ziggy Ansa is the luckiest dude right now on the planet? This free agent class is shit. So he's the beneficiary of being one of the best ones available. Now, granted, is he top of the line? Are there others out there in previous years that have come in and helped teams? Of course. It's Ziggy Ansa. He's not going to be probably a Hall of Famer. But for what the Lions need and what they're trying to execute, Doc's on board, baby. I think he's going to have a big 2018. So when the news first broke that the Lions franchised him, I wanted to accelerate my car up to about 80 miles an hour, and I wanted to run it into a light pole. No, I'm realistic, bitch. I, I am. And I wanted to get thrown through the windshield. I was so upset when, Why? I, found, when, I, was yeah. so upset when I found out they franchised him. I just, I'm not a fan of this move. If you go back, you look at his last two seasons. He's been underwhelming at best. The production that you have gotten from him last year, most of those sacks all came in one, two, or maybe three games. The rest of it, he was kind of just a guy out there, just a guy playing. Uh, you could basically take what he did in those other 13 games, and you could throw a rookie out there and say, hey, go ahead, do what you got to do. Now, I think Ziggy Ansah has potential to be a very good player. You've seen it in 2015. 2015, he played out of his mind. He played outstanding, all right? If, for some reason, they can come to an agreement and come to terms to where they can sign some type of a deal. I don't want a long-term deal because I don't trust Ziggy Ansah at this point. But if you can sign him to maybe a, a three-year deal where it's a number that's a little bit more palpable, maybe $15 million a season, I'm okay with that. And maybe I'm being short-sighted here. I just don't want to give this player this much money. It, it, it just At this point, it, it's really about, it's about standards for me. And I know it sounds stupid. He didn't earn $17.5 million last year. He played like garbage for most of the season. And if you go back a year later, like, I don't, I don't, okay, you want to say he was injured for most of last year. Okay, fine. You go back to the year before that, played like trash again. You have to go back two years to find a really productive season for him. So I don't feel like giving or rewarding a player with $17.5 million when he has totally underperformed two years in a row. So now you mean to tell me, here's a fat paycheck for you. I'm expecting you to sit there and perform like it's 2015 again? It doesn't make sense to me. I don't see the logic here in rewarding a player who hasn't done anything. At this point, Ziggy Ansa is the beneficiary of A, a really weak uh, free agency class, and B, a really weak draft class. Because if Bob Quinn or Matt Patricia felt like there was anybody who was worth a damn out there for the money and for the production that they're looking for, they just said bye-bye Ziggy Ansa. But I don't think there's anybody in this draft that they could go out and, and really get and plug in and expect something decent from. And free agency is kind of like, wah, wah, wah. So I'm upset by this. But at the same point, I kind of get it. I just feel like you're rewarding a player who doesn't deserve it. And that sits really bad in my craw. It just it bothers me so much. You're absolutely right. They do have an opportunity to to extend his contract. I mean, Von Miller, uh, a bunch of other defensive ends were franchised in the last two years, and they received longer term deals. So it is possible. But the problem that I think you're having is you don't see going forward in 2018 that he's going to be productive. I really think that if he's coached properly and there's a great defensive scheme, then you got a guy plug in place right there already on your roster can go out there and pressure the quarterback. It's hard to go out there and find dudes to do that. And I know that uh, you saw the injury plague seasons that he's had. You want him to basically earn that number. But if he's healthy, if he's a dude that can go out there and be on that field, I think he can get 10 to 15 sacks this year. I think he'd be productive. But again, big ifs and buts, right? If he's healthy, but if he's not injured or if he's not dealing with something, it seems like every single year, though, this guy is nicked up or he's dealing with some type of a high ankle sprain. And those don't just get better. Like, it takes at least four to six weeks of you doing absolutely nothing with your leg. And you can't do that when the season's going. You got to tape it and go. And he's just not been as productive as you would expect this guy, especially coming off that 2015 season. And then I hate to keep hearkening back to it, but he had like a Pro Bowl 2015 and then he was nowhere in 2016. 
And then you go 2017, and the majority of his production came in three games. So you're going to reward a guy who hasn't shown up in basically two and a half years? And it, that just, I, I don't get that. I feel like you could have went out, grabbed uh, a, a guy who'd have just been suitable uh, from free agency. You know, you don't have to sit there and cut the guy a huge, a huge check. You could get creative with your defensive front, move guys in, move guys out, try to protect whatever's, whatever, you know, your, your weak side pass rusher is and, and just, I feel like you could have masked it a little bit and did things a little bit different. I don't feel like you had to to sit there and possibly commit almost seventeen and a half billion dollars to this guy. So from what I'm hearing, you just wanted him to be let go. See you later, Sayonara. Yeah. I mean, unless you could come to some type of reasonable deal, but he wasn't gonna. It wouldn't make any sense for him, right? He was gonna come to the table and say, "No, you can franchise me because I'm gonna get seventeen and a half million dollars." You know, unless you want to extend me out and guarantee me a whole bunch of money up front. You know, that, that's the only way a deal is getting done, right? It, it's it's about business right here. This is all about business. From a business standpoint, I don't see how Ziggy Ansa is worth $17.5 million. I don't get it. And if I'm Ziggy Ansa and I know that I can get $17.5 million, I'm not signing for anything less than that. Let me hit unless we sit there and you guarantee me a contract. And we're talking maybe two to three years, and I'm going to get, I don't know, $34 million up front. Yeah, let me hit you with these numbers. What do you think about this kind of contract offer? Four years, sixty to sixty-five million, with twenty-five to thirty million guaranteed. If the I, Lions put that on the table and he takes it, would you be kind of upset? I don't want him here for four years. Do you know what I'm saying? I let me let me put it this way: If the Lions can get out of their con, get out of that contract after say year two, year three, and they're not on the hook for any more money, right? The, um, then I'm fine with it. Only yes. guarantees are twenty-five to thirty million. Then I'm fine with it. Yeah. But I, if, if I'm Ziggy Ansa, you got to look at it this way, right? You can franchise me now. I'm going to make almost $17.5 million. You can franchise me next season. I'm going to be making close to $20, $21 million. So that means everything up front, I want at least $38.5, almost $40 million. Do you know what I'm saying? Because he's trying to ensure what he would be guaranteed if he was franchised and then franchised again. So you're going to have to the number that you're talking about as far as guarantee, guaranteeing the money it's got to be closer to 40 million. It's that time of year cuz I know you're excited. Underwear Olympics. It's that time of year. I think So excited. Lots to get into with it too. I mean the, you get to watch guys who are just cut and ripped up just running down the field. My wife loves it too. Every time it's on she sits there she pauses it, watches the dudes wieners in their little tight shorts. It's so weird and uncomfortable. She's like, "Do you see that guy's wiener?" And then I got to go look and I got to go see a guy's wiener. It's so weird. That's gay. It is. <laughs> it really is. What are you looking forward to this year in terms of the NFL Besides combine? The wiener? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um so what I'm probably most looking forward to, it, it's positions of need for the Lions, right? I think this year going into the draft we have a, a clear-cut idea of what the Lions need. It's obvious they need a running back, so I'm looking at running backs. I'm really interested to see what Sony Michelle does. Um, there's a couple other guys. It's a really deep draft for running backs. Um, I'm also interested to see what Saquon Barkley does. I mean, it, he's been heads and tails above everybody else, right? So I want to see him perform next to all these other guys and see how he separates himself. It'll be interesting to me. Look, they need... Inside help, whether it be an offensive guard or it's going to be a center. So I want to see the, the offensive linemen. Um, I also want to see what happens with the guys along the defensive line. You know, it, the lines need help there as well. And I think a linebacker wouldn't help or wouldn't hurt. I'm going to be watching the linebackers as well. So the four positions and needs that I feel like the lines have to address with this draft, uh, definitely running back, possibly offensive guard, center, defensive line, whether it be an edge rusher, or whether it be a lineman and then a linebacker. Well, I, again, I'm not sure what we're going to run. Are we going to run a 3 4? Are we going to run a 4 3? I don't think anybody necessarily knows right now. It really feels like whatever the defensive front's going to be, it's going to constantly be in flex um, just because Matt Patricia, I, I think, is going to develop a defensive scheme to the talent that he has. He's going to try to make it all fit together. So I, I'm super interested in watching those four position groups. But I always love seeing how fast these guys run. Like, it blows my mind that you can move a human body that quickly. How many hours are you going to devote to it this weekend? Uh, I don't really have, I think, anything going on. So probably all day Saturday. All right. We're going to get a comprehensive report out of you. Very good. <laughs> probably. Um, most of the day on Sunday. I got to go to the radio station and work a little bit on Sunday. But I'll just turn the TV on there and watch it. So, you know, whatever. 
See, it, for me, I always get excited to kind of start the process, but then it just is really boring because the same thing over and over and over again. You got the weightlifting, you got the the on the field, and then, you know, what it is is just a bunch of names that you don't really know about. O- outside of, like, maybe five that's people. how you learn, bro. That's right, how you learn, right. But then it's just a bunch of nondescript guys from, like, Middle Tennessee State, and he does this and he does that. And it's a bunch of film of, like, you have, football you have, that's not really that good. Do you ever watch it with Andrea? No. No? Oh, you see, I, I found it to be most enjoyable, and this will be cool when I have a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully I have a son, or if I have a daughter who's a tomboy, it, whatever, it would be cool. I find it most enjoyable when I watch it with Lorraine, because we'll be watching it, and she'll ask me really interesting questions, like stuff that I don't think about and stuff that you probably wouldn't think about, because we know sports, right? Like, what will she ask you? You watch stuff, she'll be like, okay, so why, why was he slower than that guy? He looks like he's smaller. <laughs> oh. And then I'll be like, okay, well, here, I was like, you want to watch his hips. Watch how his hips turn here. Watch, watch how he gets up off the ball. You know, there's just different things, right? Like he's not as explosive and she's like, well, how do you know that? And then you got to go back and you got to try to rewind the tape and you got to show her why and how. So I, I find that to be really interesting. And I find that to be very, very fun because she asks really, really good questions that are pointed and she wants to know why this isn't working out for this guy, but it's working out for this guy. And what did this guy do so much better that makes you say, Hey, that's really good. And so I find it to be most fun watching it with her. I mean, okay. besides her pointing out random wieners, which I don't really <laughs> enjoy, but it's always funny. All right. So what are you making of Mel Kuyper and Mike Mayock and kind of the things that you're hearing with the Detroit Lions? Uh, Mel Kuyper's come out and said that there's a chance the Lions could add a solid pass rusher late in the draft. Or Mike Mayock's come out and said that you could add an interior offensive lineman late in the draft. What are you making of kind of how others in the national media are piecing together what the Lions could do? early and late in this year's draft? Well, I kind of like both trains of thought here. I think if you're the Detroit Lions, you've already re-upped with Ziggy Ansah. He's coming back no matter what, so you know that you have him. So if you want to sit there and you want to save your your sixth, seventh round pick for uh, an edge rusher, a guy who's going to be a project, sure, knock yourself out. As far as offensive line goes, I don't want the Lions to wait any longer than probably, I'd say, the third round. Um, you're going to want to get a guy who can come in and instantly start and make an impact. And the reason I say third round is just because I think there's too much talent as far as a defensive tackle goes on the board, and they'll probably take that maybe in the first round, maybe in the second round. And whatever they whatever they address in the first or second round, uh, the running back's going to be the next pick or will be the first pick. So it's either going to be running back or uh, a defensive end or defensive tackle in the first two rounds. So then you come back that third round, I think that's where you get your your offensive guard or your center, depending on what's going to happen with Graham Glasgow. And at that point, I think you really solidify that offense because now you've got your running back, you've got your your offensive uh you got your your offensive line is now taken care of and you've added some depth and you've added a, a piece to your defensive line. So then at this point, I think you start filling out your, your linebacking core, you maybe look to add an extra corner because those guys always get hurt. You can maybe add some other weapons if you need to. But my first three picks are going to go defensive tackle, running back. You can either flip-flop those either way. I don't necessarily care as long as you get guys who, who work and pan out. And then you're going to go third round. You're going to go uh, offensive tackle. So I, I like where both their heads are at. Um, probably Mel Kuyper more, which is unusual because I usually hate Kuyper. But you can invest a late round pick in in, a, in an edge rusher that's going to be a project. I need a guy on my offensive line who's going to start day one. Besides Le'Veon Bell, have you picked that free agency at all? Um, I know a lot of people in town are kind of peeking at Malcolm Butler, players on the defensive side of the football. There's another side that you know Bob Quinn can improve upon with this football team. The draft is probably hitting about 50%. Most people do believe he's improving the team. Last year's draft, more people are critical of it than we want it to be. But unfortunately, hey, he's learning on the job, and there maybe are some picks that he didn't miss on. But there is also free agency. There is an opportunity, and uh, I don't think he did the best of job in terms of going out there and spending a boatload of money on the offensive line. But I do think that there's an opportunity in free agency if he went out there to potentially improve this team maybe by addressing depth, running back, and other positions through free agency. Anybody that's catching your eye or all, anybody that would be a fantasy player that maybe you'd want on this team that maybe that maybe could help this team? Well, we already talked about Le'Veon Bell before. Everybody would love that. Yeah, I, I think that would be, it'd be freaking awesome, wouldn't it? But most teams don't really go out there and get the star running back You know, in terms of free agency. They just get it through the draft. Right, right. Um, a, a guy who you go out there and you could then in, take that third-round pick and invest in somebody else, uh, Andrew Norwell, 
uh, offensive guard from the Panthers. I think that again, offensive line is not a position that you really realize that you need until you absolutely need it and you, you see it. how bad it is, right? Right. So you go out there, you get that guy, and I think that helps solidify that offensive line. Again, you brought up Malcolm Butler. I wouldn't mind him. I think he'd be awesome. How would uh, Allen Robinson look? Now, Allen Robinson, this is a guy that when I was working for the Oakland Press and I was writing for the paper, I covered him a couple times in, in high school. I found him to be a really engaging young man. Um, I found him to be a lot of fun to watch. He was, he was always a playmaker. And then he goes to Jacksonville. He plays out of his mind. Like, I didn't expect him to be that good. He ended up going to Penn State, and he was, he was good. He was, he was actually really good. Um, I didn't expect him to be as talented as he was at the NFL level. And the guy just plays out of his mind. So you could take Golden Tate, Marv Jones. You have Kenny Galladay, who I think is still kind of coming along. And then you could add Allen Robinson. I mean, that's pretty lethal. You know, Allen Robinson can go, can play inside and outside. He's one of those guys who you can do a lot of different things with. Hmm. I think that would be, I think he'd be an interesting guy to add. More toys for Stafford. That's all you want to do. No. Just give him more toys. I'm just, I'm just, you know, what's, what's closer to being more complete, the offense or the defense at this point, right? Mm. The offense is, you know, I think you, I think long term, you build your defense through the draft. And then on the offensive side, you can go out, grab some pieces here and there and put them in and do what you got to do. Do what you got to do. So I mean, you go get uh, Don Terry Poe if you want. I wouldn't mind him for uh, your defensive tackle spot. I think that'd be cool. Again, I don't know what the hell we're running. Are we running a 4-3, running a 3-4? It makes it really hard to sit there and look at free agents and guys that I want on my wish list when I got no idea what scheme we're running. I mean, I know most of the time we're going to be in a nickel or we're going to be in a dime. I get it. I totally get it. But all that being said, you still got – Positions that have to be filled out, and you can't load up with nine defensive tackles and only have two edge rushers. You know what I'm saying? So I, there's, there's, I, I need more information. I need more information. Carlos Hyde would be cool too. You know, I mean, just guys. I mean, I'm just naming guys at this point. That's I think, good. That's good. I think Carlos Hyde would work really well here. Mm-hmm. I think he has shown that he can run between the tackles and he can get outside. He's not as, I guess, explosive or impactful as a guy like Le'Veon Bell is. So we still need to see what Pittsburgh's going to do, if they're going to franchise Le'Veon Bell or not. Um, so that story needs to be developed a little bit more. But would you have a problem with them bringing Le'Veon Bell in and giving him a massive, ridiculous contract, something close to, what, like $17, $18, 20000000 million? Ooh, that's probably, a lot of money. The big risk is how much does he have left because he's a dude that's got a lot of tread on those tires and they're going to ask their running back, you know, to do a lot of things, and I don't know. It's just if other teams don't do it, I don't see a scenario in which the the Lions would would try and pull that off and be successful. So no, just try to go out there and find that stud rookie and uh, go from there. Twenty two year old running backs are a lot better than twenty six year old running backs. But if it's Le'Veon Bell and the money's right and you can do it, I think a lot of people would be super excited. Yeah, uh, dude, I'd be pumped if you can go get that guy. Oh, that makes sense. It'd be awesome. Can't wait, man. March, April in the NFL. I, I do like the fact that it doesn't close down. A lot of good things to talk about with the NFL. Can't wait for the NFL draft, and you cannot wait for the NFL combine. Good stuff, sir. Can't wait do, to hear about it. Do you realize that the average running back makes roughly, what is this here? I'm looking at sports track right now. I love sports track. It's so awesome. Uh, let's see. So the average team has four running backs. That position is usually allocated about six to seven million dollars. Right now, LaShawn McCoy brings in almost nine million dollars. So if I'm Le'Veon Bell and I'm hitting free agency, I'm saying I want because I think Le'Veon Bell is a way better running back than LaShawn McCoy is. I want what? Thirteen million dollars, fourteen million dollars. I'd go sign Le'Veon Bell for fourteen million dollars. I'd bring him in on a on a four or five year contract, fourteen, fifteen million dollars. And I give them a bunch of money up front, guaranteed. Okay, let's take our final timeout. We'll come back, play around to the doctors in session. Jock has a lot of questions, a lot of things on his mind. He's got to get it off his chest or he's going to burst at the seams. Stay with us. You're listening to the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Thanks, everybody, for your continued support. We wouldn't be able to keep the microphones hot, the studio lights on here at the Detroit Sports Podcast Network here in Sterling Heights without your great support. Free and easy way to support the project. Visit our website, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. You can see what show airs when. You can take care of all your online shopping needs, take care of buying Detroit sports tickets. We greatly appreciate the great support 
Each and every time we check the numbers, everything has been trending upward, and we can't do it without your support. It makes it fun for Adam and I to continue to check the emails, check the fun things that go on on our Twitter page without your great support. Free and easy way, support us. Visit our website, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. Have to bring the show down just a little bit. Bob Quinn at the Combine, kind of talking a little bit. You know what he said? What? Eric Ebron, 2018, will be a Detroit Lion. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I just seen your tweet uh, <laughs> where you'd rather lose a tire to a pothole. Yeah. <laughs> Mind you, I was going to tell you, on my way here, I was driving down 16 Mile, coming from Ryan towards the Quinder. Oh, my God, man. I almost fell in one and lost my entire front end. The, Nuts. Pic- the pictures of officers jumping in potholes all over the state is embarrassing. It is. It's really ridiculous that you don't see this in other states. Why is Michigan, you know, with, with all the stuff we got going on, the Motor City doesn't have a, a proper track to put the motors on? Did you, really? Did you Have you driven down Mound? Oh. Mound Road is, is absolutely bananas. Stopped. Cut me cold. I do not. I take I take uh, Van Dyke up. I, oh, I, dude. I've avoided it because it's probably, and I do believe it's the worst, it's road, the worst road in the entire country. Yeah. And it's right there, you know, around here. Uh, like, I've been on dirt roads areas. that are much smoother than Mound Road. Exactly. And it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's so disappointing. Hate to bring you guys down, but, hey, Eric Ebron's going to be catching touchdowns. All right, Eric Ebron. You know what that means, though? Wah, wah, wah. Ebron hype video number three. Oh. We'll try, man. We've tried for the last two years to hype him up. Yeah. And uh, to update you on what we said, he did fall short of the numbers that I said. I don't think he got 700 yards and 10 touchdowns. Maybe, so. maybe next, maybe next week we sit there and we predict uh, Eric Ebron. I think he'll trend upward, but I, I think the same number Look, that I put for number two, I got to put for hype video number three. I mean, I, I all I asked for was 700 yards and 10 touchdowns. It's not a lot, right? It wasn't a lot. He didn't get there. Here's the thing: he played a much better second half last year than he did his first half. So I think they're going off of what he did that second half where they're like, okay, we're supremely confident. He's learned how to catch the ball. Because uh, I think he only had like two or three drop passes last, uh, like, like the last eight games of the season. So I think they're, they're buying into that hype. So we'll see what happens. I don't know. I'm not sold on Eric Ebron. I don't think I'll ever be sold on Eric Ebron. <laughs> Many won't. All right, this is what we call the doctors in session. You got a lot of questions lined up, and I know I'm ready to deliver. I'm looking forward to it greatly. This is what we call the doctors in session. But to be the man, you got to beat the man. And I'm saying, woo, right here, I'm the man. Woo! All right, so like I had mentioned earlier when we were talking Red Wings, um, we had a lot of different hockey discussions going on this past Sunday. And something that was brought up by my buddy Scott, and this is something that Pavel Datsuk had echoed as well. After winning the gold medal, Datsuk said that his gold medal means more than any Stanley Cup he's ever won. Mind you, he's won two. What would mean more to you, a Stanley Cup or a gold medal, and why? When people heard that, a lot of people were upset. And it's tough because a lot of people have felt like they invested in Pavel Datsuk, invested in the Red Wings. But sometimes you do have to acknowledge that most people, and I'm the same way, would value your loyalty to your country more than the loyalty to the team. Now, that's not to say that he, it, it wouldn't be special. It's not to say that you wouldn't love representing your city, representing the professional sports organization. But there's something different, inherently important, about putting the uh, jersey on that says Olympic athlete from nowhere. You know what I mean? It's really important for him to actually look up and stare at those three circles and be like, Where's our music? Oh, there is no music because there was no real country that we represented this year. Oh, wait a minute. We were banned from the Olympics, but we still showed up as the Olympic athletes from the banned country. Well, okay. Good for you, Pavel. You know, staring up at there. It was interesting to see because I, I was kind of curious what they would do. They just played the Olympic song. That's all they yeah. did. But, you know, all, all kidding aside, I think that any athlete, most athletes, I think would choose, and I would as well. Loyalty to country, it, there is something to be said about uh, having the flag draped around you. There's more people in your country than there are locally and things like that. And so it's a big deal to these athletes. I would choose the same thing. I think that loyalty to country should supersede the loyalty that you have to the organization professionally that you're playing for. I don't think there's a wrong answer, but I'm totally different. The grind to win a Stanley Cup is unreal. The things that these guys do to sit there and hoist that trophy 
blows my mind. It's an 82 game regular season, and then you've got to win 16 more over the course of four rounds. Good luck with all of that. I mean, I've seen a guy sit there and take a hockey puck off the leg, shattering his his what is it tibula and fibula, and then try to skate on it for another minute before he can crawl his way off the ice. The things that they do for a Stanley Cup is absolutely insane. What about Russia, dude? Like curlers are juicing. Like, <laughs> like you brought up curling when we opened the show, and like the American curlers, they're like fat soccer dads. Like they got like weird mustaches. You could see them holding a beer, throwing stones down. The Russian curlers, they're all sitting there juicing up. I don't know why you need to be on roids. It doesn't make any sense. The funniest story I think of the Olympics was the girl that said, "I don't dope," and then she got tested and, uh, and she tested dopes. positive. It's just like in Russia, dude. You're born with like a with a syringe full of steroids, and they're like, "Here, this is going in. It's going to help you." Okay, cool. <laughs> Exactly. It's one of those things where you look at it and you say, I guess a country that's destined to cheat is just always going to cheat. They just feel like that they they want to go with the age old adage. If you're not cheating, you're not trying. I and, guess. and in the face of being caught, they're still doing it. So I thought that the Olympics kind of were a little bit weak. If you're going to ban a country, you don't show up, period. Yeah. Your entire you don't need to have the Olympic athletes of it just sounded ridiculous. Yeah. You know, it took away from potentially. I thought it was others. weird. When yeah. It'd be like OAR. I'm like, or? Yeah. Like, or? What? Please, or? Please. What's going on? All right, let's move on. Uh, what did you think about the NCAA forcing Miles Bridges to pay $40, which was essentially the value of the dinner that his mother ended up having with an agent? to a charity of his choice as part of his reinstatement so he could play basketball for the rest of the season. Baby. Well, I got chomp <laughs> on this one. I know you like that, right? I do. Well, the news came out, and again, everybody rushed to judgment, including myself. I mean, you have to react to these things. But my first reaction was the same reaction I have now. I don't care. I mean, in the end, people are looking at college athletes and they're debating whether they should get paid or not and things like that. But the way the story goes, Miles Bridges was found to be ineligible. And in 24 hours, they made a case and said, look, he's ineligible, but how do we get him back? The NCAA said, look, for 40 bucks, just pay it back to a charity. And now you're reinstated in 24 hours. So the NCAA, it was technically a violation, but you know what's going on. You know that minor things like that are going to be brushed under the rug as soon as possible so that Miles Bridges can be on TV, so that he can be in the Big Ten tournament, so that he can participate in the NCAA tournament. You know they're not going to seriously look at something like that. Now, when you got a coach potentially you know, on a wiretap saying some things like, I can hook you up with 100 k that's a little bit more severe. But in that front... I think you and I have joked about it. We've talked about it quite a bit of times. I don't care. I think that if you're an NCAA athlete and you see the market, okay, you're in this thing and you see your coach, he rolls up in his Lexus, you see all the announcers in their suits, they're making a bunch of money. Dude, you got kids that are starting blogs that see signs and see things. They make shirts. They're making money. Friend of the podcast, Brandon Justice, making money selling shirts off of the backs of Jordan Poole. Jordan Poole can't make any of that money. He don't see a dime. So you're seeing that. You're an athlete, and you're seeing, man, these young kids are starting blogs, starting their own companies. They're start, They're getting investors, and they're making money off of my back, and some dude's going to scratch me a check for 500 bucks. You think I'm going to turn that down? Please. I think what has to happen is these dudes got to get smarter and stop getting caught. I mean, dude, it's not that hard, bro. If I was popular... You and I are cousins. I'm like, don't talk to me. Go find my dude, Adam. He hangs out here. Go to the old shillelagh, 9 o'clock on Saturday. Something good will happen. We're going to have a meeting. And you know Adam's going to walk out of that meeting with 10 Gs in his pocket. And then somehow or another, I will walk away with some money. Period. It's not that hard. I mean, literally, just figure out a way. You know, get your money. I don't begrudge anybody because when you read anything in what goes on in this country, it's called capitalism. Mm -hmm. The NCAA is making billions, and you guys are hating on kids making thousands. Come on. Yeah, I don't understand. Like the whole system is screwed up and broken. And, and you're I right. don't think it is screwed up and broken. I think what has to happen oh, no, is, dude, it is because look, let it happen. Just stop, stop shedding the light on it. If these kids can go on the black market, and get a couple G's here and there, let them do it. Just, look, uh, just not talk about it. If we were, if we, if you were in college, all right, and you were a musician. Or you know, we'll just take this podcast, for instance, right? Yeah. You're in college, I'm in college, and we put this podcast together, right? And we're able to sit there and, and siphon some dollars out of it, and, and we turn a profit, right? If we're student athletes, we can't claim any of that. We can't take any of that. Right. Well, this is our hard-earned effort, our hard-earned labor. This is what we do, and we're able to sit there and, and, and spin a profit out of it? 
but you can't take any of that money, even though you've invested all this time and all this energy in it, because you play basketball, I play football. Really? Like th- that's messed up, man. If you're if you're really good at music, you can produce your own record. And it could hit big, and you could go four times platinum, and you could sit there and cash all those royalty checks. But if you're really good at singing, and you go four times platinum, and you cash those royalty checks, you better not play basketball, you better not play football, you better not play any sport in college. It's really messed up. The, the, the way that the rules are written are, are just obscene and obnoxious. When the Yahoo report ended up breaking, and Bridges was named in the uh, FBI report, you kind of hold your breath a little bit and start to think, well, maybe Izzo... Had some nefarious dealings. I mean, with everything that has been surrounding MSU the last little bit, you had the 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 weird pieces with uh, pardon or with um, outside the lines. outside the lines and, and everything going on with ESPN. And at certain points, Izzo has looked shaken, um, has looked uncomfortable when speaking in front of the media. I mean, when I heard this, I started thinking, I was like, well, maybe we got to start taking a closer look. And then a day goes by, and it's like everything kind of gets cleaned up and, and cleared up. So initially, when it broke, were you like, hey, maybe? Well, Michigan fans jump on right away and are like, oh, no, throw no, the book at Michigan no, State. No, no, they no, should no. have the death penalty. No, no, no. They no. should have this and that. No, Look, listen. I'm not your usual Michigan not fan. Not you. I'm not your usual Michigan fan. And and I still, I was like, well, maybe we need to start looking at this a little bit closer. I had yeah. that moment. I had that moment. Because I've been on record as saying, I believe Izzo follows the letter of the law. He does it the right way. I, I've, I've said that. And I was like, well, maybe now I look like a dummy. Yeah, no, I I just don't want Michigan State to be under the microscope because when you're under the microscope and you have people investigating you, they're going to find stuff. I mean, every program has something that you can talk about. So um, I'm just looking forward to the results of the investigation and keeping it moving forward. I mean, 40 bucks, no big deal. Even if Miles Bridges' mom got a $400 advance, big whoop-de-woo. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal at all. They should just say, look, you know what? If you're going to take money, then you got to do something, you know, positive with it, or you got to do something that uh, you just can't get caught. You just can't get caught. Look, if you get caught, things like that. I mean, I guess the the simplest thing we got to do is NCAA's got to reform this and find ways for these athletes to get some money because in a capitalistic society, when athletes figure out that they're getting taken advantage of, you're going to have a black market. And even if athletes get paid. If someone's making two G's a month, someone's going to be out there trying to make three. I think the system is just too big. It's just too big. I don't think you're going to get a situation where a rule is going to be handed out where nobody's going to test it and try to push it. Big money's involved, man. Big money's involved. So when you got big numbers like that and big money, it's the way it is. Let's take a look at your crappy Pistons. Um, Who's to blame for the Pistons playing as poorly as they have the last three weeks? It's been obscene. Well, it's been obscene. It has been really challenging. It's looking like the trade for Blake Griffin is going to blow up in their face this season. Um, you let go of productive players in Avery Bradley and Tobias Harris. You can see what they're doing over there in the Clippers. Just look at their numbers. The challenging part with the Pistons right now is you basically blew up the team to get one guy. You got two players on the team that are productive, Andre and Blake Griffin. Okay, so let's just say they, they ball out each and every game and they score 30 each. That's 60 points. You need other guys to step it up, and they got nobody. So I'm not going to sit here and be pretentious and think that, oh, my God, when Reggie Jackson comes back, this is going to turn it all around. There's no effort on the floor. They're not playing any defense. They're not doing anything properly. You just don't have enough talent outside of Andre and Blake Griffin. The guys are just aren't good enough, and that falls at the feet of Stan Van Gundy. It's his fault, and the team is terrible. It's tough to watch. They're getting blown out. It's not like they're being competitive. And when each and every night he's asked what's going on, he says he doesn't know. It's your job to fix it. And I'm kind of hoping it continues so that they blow out SVG. It's unfortunate to say that, but this team is terrible, and that's what I want to keep seeing. I am frustrated that when you start looking deeper into Blake Griffin's game, it's not that hard. You just kind of force him out to the outside, and you know he's trying his best to make some things happen. But sometimes you just got to shoot the outside jumper when it's given to you. I know teams are trying to stop him. And they're they're doubling him, or they're you know trying to force him to. They're trying to force him into doing things he doesn't want to do. But hey, if that outside shot's there, you got to take it. But unfortunately, Blake Griffin's been inconsistent. That's led to some problems. The team's not good enough. The defense has been terrible. The effort's not been there. And quite frankly, everybody that kind of has looked at it says Stan Van's offense looks like it's out of the '90s. It's not good enough. It's not innovative enough. It's nothing special. Teams can figure it out. And when you play good teams like Toronto, they just whip your ass. That's just the way it is. And and actually, it sucks that it didn't happen sooner. 
race to the bottom, keep losing. But you start again too late. You race to the bottom with 20 games left. No, race to the bottom with 40 games left. Get yourself maybe into that top four picks where the pick is protected. But no, what's going to happen is the Pistons will finish with, you know, a record that earns them the eighth pick and it's gone. So this is the team you're looking at. You're not going to be that much different. You're just going to add a bunch of role players, and uh, all you can ask for is a new coach to get a new message or a new philosophy. But this is garbage. It's absolute garbage. You know, if you were uh, a new general manager or you were a new coach, would you even want to take this job? No, it's You've got nothing for the future. You're stuck and saddled with guys like Andre Drummond, Blake Griffin, and Reggie Jackson. Jackson. That's your big three. That's your big three. That's all you've got. You have no more money for anybody else. So, all, like you said, all you're going to be able to do is go out there and get some average role players at best, guys you can kind of put on your bench, and then you've got no picks. And we've discussed this with the Red Wings. Yikes. You've got to build through the draft. <laughs> you build through the draft, and you, you end up with, with a championship-caliber team. Five games was the luster for the Blake Griffin trade. Five games. Five. And, no, it's not. And that was basically, you know, teams playing on a back-to-back and you getting lucky. So, that's all we deserve is five games of hope. That's the life of a Pistons fan. You get to see five games where you basically jumped on teams that were uh, at a disadvantage. You we'll, think anything we'll, will save this season? I think I think it should just go this way, and that's the, that's what should happen so that SVG can be blown out of here. He is somebody that's coming out and just doing things that nobody really likes. And each and every day he addresses the media, I think he loses more fans. I agree with you. Uh, what do you think about SVG saying that the NCAA is one of the worst organizations, maybe the worst organization ever? Stop it. I just think that <laughs> I want you to focus on putting a, a product on the floor that can stop somebody, that can uh, not give up uh, 40 points in a quarter. You know, I, Listen, Stan Van has a right to talk about whatever he wants, but I just don't think that when you look at it and you say, well, Stan, uh, you're talking about the uh, NCAA being racist. Well, did you know that the policy of one and dones is basically made by your colleagues at the NBA level. So what kind of facts are you trying to spin to me here? I mean, I know the facts. I can read. So you're not spinning me the right facts. So if you want to change it, then go talk to your brethren and change the rule. But I like the rule. I feel like at least a year of college is something that helps people with maturity. I like two and done. I think all across the board in terms of college athletes before they hit professional. I think they should play two years of college mandatory and, and no uh, no youngster before the age of 20 should enter into a professional league because what's there in the professional leagues? Big money, big temptations, and an 18-year-old just not mature enough. Yeah, you can have the talent. Great, take your talent to Michigan State and do something. So that's my thoughts on it is that all athletes, all athletes should stay in college for two years mandatory so you can grow and learn and uh, formulate some opinions and get coached and learn uh, how to hone your craft because when you're 18 years old and you're playing up against a 36-year-old dude that's been working out for the last 18 years, it's a mismatch. And and even if a dude has talent, okay, I'm not, as a psychologist, just willing to just say, hey, that dude's an athlete. You know, when when people say, just stick to sports, that's disrespectful, I think it's disrespectful for those people that hate on us that give the opinion that, look, College is okay. Let the kid mature. If he's got talent, he'll have talent when he's 20. Then he'll still have the same talent when he's 20 than he does now at 18. Let him grow two years. Let him be part of a system uh, in, in a football program or a basketball program or a baseball program. You don't have to make radical changes. It's just, hey, you have to go to college for two years. And look, if you want to you know, remove the guys and the silliness of a student athlete, look, let him just... Let them learn coaching. Let them learn baseball. Let them major in football. Let the athlete major in basketball. That way he can kind of have some skills, you know, that if he doesn't make it, then potentially can get him on. That potentially could get him uh, somewhere coaching in high school or start the process of getting uh, trained as a coach. So I think there are easy reforms you can make, but I don't think it's racist that, uh, you know, the NCAA makes kids stay for, for one year. It's just it is different with other systems, but I just wish SVG would address people realistically and just focus on right now the Pistons because more people care about that than I, than I do think care about what he thinks about the NCAA. And I think if you were to force kids to stay for at least two years, it's a much better product, both the NBA and the NCAA. Think about it. You got really talented kids now forced to play an extra year. So they learn the system. It's now year two of that system. You can do a little bit more, build upon it. They're refining their skills. So when they take that next step and they hit the league, they're much more mature, like you said, both physically, mentally, and their games developed a little bit. So it makes for a better NBA product. So I think it's win-win all the way around. I think you're onto something there. 
All Great right, job, sir. man. Yes, awesome. sir. Good podcast. Enjoyed the banter back and forth. Always enjoy the podcast recording. Outstanding, man. This was awesome. Before we get out of here, special announcement. You are going to the podcast Detroit Studios to do the Breaking Down the Ring podcast. Now, this will already air after you have gone into the studio, but when the archive hits, when it's put to YouTube and iTunes, we'll post the link and tag you in it at Adam R-S-T-R-O-Z. I'm looking forward to you bringing the noise regarding professional wrestling, and you'll do the, you'll do a good job. I have no doubt about it. Should be a good time. You know, Mikey is hilarious. They do a great job over there. So it's going to be cool to, to finally meet the entire band of uh, – of everybody over there breaking down the ring. There's like nine people, so it's going to be fun to see. Yes, sir. All right. For the jock, Adam Strozinski, I am the doc, John Macaroon, episode 238 in the books. Very good stuff, sir. Outstanding, man. This was fun, as always. I got this cough drop in my mouth right now. It's just, I got this awful cough. I don't know what the hell's going on. Talk soon. See everybody next Thursday. This was Locker Room Talk. Second dick. Sorry, Detroit. <laughs> Didn't quite work out. And I, all I can say is Detroit Sports Podcast scores. I hear voices in my head. They counsel me. They understand. They talk to me. They talk to me.